All right, so we talked a lot about uh, management of bone defects in the last set of slides, Ilazarov techniques, uh, vascularized grafting, uh, autogenous uh, cancellous grafting, and then some sort of unusual techniques like using cages and, and things like that. Um, so we'll conclude now by just talking a little bit about uh, dead space management, soft tissue defects. I'm uh, really not going to get too much into flaps and everything like that. Uh, but just a few things you should be uh, aware of, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, so in uh, grade 3, uh, certainly grade 3B open tibia fractures, uh, you do have to think about muscle flaps, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, in the, in the, traditionally, in the proximal third, uh, you can use uh, uh, like a gastrocnemius flap, uh, right? So coverage in, I would say, the proximal third would be gastroc. Um, so uh, rotational flaps, that is. Uh, in the middle third, um, traditionally we say that if the soleus right, is available and uh, can be rotated into a defect, can help cover it. And then in the distal third, uh, traditionally it's free tissue transfer, although the reverse soleal flap is a common option that some surgeons are using uh, for rotational flap coverage here. But uh, this is sort of the traditional way you would break it down and still is used frequently. So for larger and more distal defects, something like shown here in this picture, um, yeah, free tissue transfer can be done. And of course, this doesn't look so pretty right now. Over time, this, this atrophies and can smooth out and look pretty reasonable. Um, negative pressure wound therapy and skin grafting can be done. Uh, we don't always have to do free flaps for every defect. There are other ways around this. Uh, local soft tissue arrangement, uh, negative pressure therapy, grafting sometimes will uh, uh, help. But again, as long as it doesn't take weeks and months, because that's where bacteria have the opportunity to get in there. Remember, if you want to get these covered relatively efficiently. I've talked a lot about dead space management before. I think it's worth bringing up again. Uh, remember, don't be afraid to use this early on. So many of you hearing this, uh, you may be a resident, you're going to be on call uh, one of these days coming up and open tibia comes in, uh, open whatever comes in and it's nasty and it, it looks like you're going to have to go back for a second look. Um, put in some beads. Put in some antibiotic beads. Uh, just get some polymethyl methacrylate, add some vancomycin, tobramycin, check what the patient's allergies are, and um, you can uh, go ahead and uh, help to take up that dead space, deliver antibiotics, hopefully prevent infection. All right, and remember that these deliver high doses of local antibiotics um, and, uh, you know, higher local concentration than you can get safely by administering these uh, systemically. So if you had a, let's say, a certain amount of uh, cement, you know, if you just make it into one big ball, the available surface area you know, for elution is, is limited to what's on the surface of that ball, as opposed to if you take that same thing and make it into a bunch of little balls, right, you're going to have a lot more surface area exposed for elution, right? So, you know, you get the idea. Um, so typically, when, when we're using beads, try to make little small beads, okay? And when you put a spacer in, again, the reason for that, as mentioned before, is that it is easier to take that out. You get a nice membrane that forms around this uh, spacer. So when you, you know, when you come in and you sort of like peel this out, and you, you, know, you take it out of there, uh, you've got this sort of like nice membrane here that potentially has pluripotential cells and can help and then you deliver your bone graft into this area. Let's just say the spacer was sitting in a, in a defect uh, as opposed to ripping out all of these beads which get, you know, you get all this scar tissue that forms in between and pulling this thing out is a bit of a mess and sometimes a little bit dangerous, especially if you have you know, if it pulls out scar tissue that's, you know, wrapped up around the blood vessel down here or something. Okay, so um, a little bit about uh, antibiotic beads. 
Um, just a couple of papers I think you should be aware of. Uh, these go back a little bit now, but the LEAP study uh, is something you should be uh, you should be familiar with. Okay, so remember this, this is a large cohort study. This was a major um, paper in um, I think modern orthopedic trauma. Uh, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and there have been many many spin-off papers from this data set. Um, this particular patient showed that, I'm sorry, study showed that the most significant prognostic factors for outcomes in these limb-threatening injury cases, basically everything I've been talking about in this set of slides, um, this is what really impacts outcomes. And it's got almost nothing to do with what I, ta what I talked about. It's, it's amazing. There's a lot, all this stuff that's within your control, but then there's some stuff that's just out of your control, and that's what actually determines outcomes kind of sobering. But keep this in mind, low educational level, smoking history, income b below the poverty line, nine white uh, racial background, lack of insurance, poor social support network. So that's what seems to have the most impact on outcomes, stuff that's kind of beyond our control, unfortunately. Uh, of course, you control what you can, uh, but you have to keep in mind that uh, these have uh, an impact as well. Another interesting um, paper coming out of the uh, LEAP study, um, this demonstrated, well this was looking to see uh, what, what were the difference between reconstruction and amputation, and no major differences um, uh, between the both, so it makes you wonder when is it you know, better to do one versus the other. Uh, I think what this does though is, it, it you know, when you have a, a, a really bad uh, mangled extremity, uh, cases like you've seen in this in this slide deck, um, often the initial gut reaction, you see something like that, you're like, oh, this patient should just be amputated right away. Um, I find that to be infrequently the case. I think oftentimes, um, you know, that patient may need an amputation, but usually not on the t right when they come in. Um, and I've mentioned this before, I think when a patient has this, they, they come in, if it's at all reasonable and possible, you save the limb, and then you make a determination, I think that first week or so, is this going to go south or is it going to go well? And then I think from what we know from the LEAP study, I don't think it's fair to say that all these patients are just better off with a BKA, just like, you know, get a BKA and get on with your life. Um, that can work for some patients. Uh, but for other patients, it, it doesn't. And I think what the LEAP study has shown is that just getting a BKA and a prosthesis and getting on with your life is not that much better than uh, reconstruction. Okay. Another interesting bit of data from the LEAP study, um, uh, what about the insensate foot? Right. So some traditional thinking has always been that, well, if you have an insensate foot, that is not worth salvaging. And what they showed in this cohort was that plantar numbness in a mangled leg, not necessarily a criteria for amputation. A lot of these people regain sensation, so you got to be really careful with using that as a criteria. Again, it's a relatively small number of patients, but uh, a big cohort which looked very carefully at this. Um, just throw in a paper from the plastic surgery literature, um, looking at similar uh, type of patient population, type 3, B, and C fractures of the tibia. Uh, a systematic review and no significant evidence to support salvage or amputation for these. Now, um, there certainly are other types of mangled extremities. I'm talking a lot about usual blunt trauma. There are also um, uh, ballistic and blast injuries that's a little bit of a different type of mechanism, different type of contamination. Um, Certainly from our uh, military literature, uh, the mangled extremity severity scores, I didn't really talk about that too much in this, in this uh, lecture, uh, but just, I'll just point out here, it was not particularly helpful to help them predict amputation. It's something that other authors in the past have suggested as a, as a sort of tool to help decide if you should amputate or not. Um, but a lot of these blast injuries they found are better treated with amputation than limb salvage. And again, it's a different type of, it's a different type of injury, uh, different type of contamination, much higher degree of uh, soft tissue injury. Um, here's a paper just sort of um, uh, demonstrating the effect of blast uh, mechanisms on, uh, on limb salvage. And you can see, uh, you know, this, at least from this particular study, blast injuries, improvised explosive devices, 
mines uh, causing um, you know amputation in the in these patients um, you know as much as I, I that that we see uh, injured soldiers get back to duty with amputations it's difficult um, as you would imagine. Again, many of these people are very motivated, very fit, very committed to getting back out there, and these are the type of patients who actually do well with amputations. Um, but, uh, at least in this paper, um, overall, uh, not a lot of people return to uh, duty, 16.5% uh, in this study. Um, and uh, perhaps that's increased a little bit. Uh, there are newer devices out there and a lot of work being done by our orthopedic trauma uh, colleagues uh, uh, in the military. Uh, this is one such device. Uh, this is called an uh, uh, ADEO okay. um, device. And uh, this potentially will be commercially available at some point. Uh, but this is kind of a... Um, uh, sort of like, I would think of it like an AFO on steroids a little bit, uh, and this can assist uh, these patients recovering from limb salvage surgery uh, to uh, enhance their function, and certainly um, patients who've returned to, to active duty have benefited from this device. And it's interesting, I get asked about this. This was in Time Magazine, so I got patients who've come in and sort of said, you know, can I, can I get that? And it's something that's been a little tricky to get for patients, but I think we'll see this uh, on the horizon. Okay, so um, I'm going to end there. Uh, you just saw a peek at the next slide. There is a uh, uh, different talk that I'm going to do on chronic osteomyelitis. That's sort of the uh, uh, natural follow-up talk uh, to this, uh, but um, thanks for your attention.